In our fairly recent history, there are very good examples of very ambitious projects that got done very, very quickly. Disneyland, start to finish, 365 days. Empire State Building, 410 days, the tallest building in history at the time. From the day that Tony Fidel was hired to the day they shipped the iPod, 290 days. Moving at that speed almost feels impossible, but it doesn't need to be that way. Frank Slootman's quote, narrow the focus, up the quality, increase the speed. It doesn't need to be fully featured. Scope it down, make sure you're shipping quality, and you will get the speed. Welcome back to the Rise Over Run podcast. I am Doug Barnett with my co-host, Brant Choate. What's up? And of course, we've got a new topic for you today that hopefully is interesting. Um, it's interesting for us. We're talking about the two magnetic poles of speed versus quality. And, you know, how you should think about that as you work in, you know, te technically, or most of the time we're talking about software companies, employees that work at software companies, and how do I make some of the decisions on, on this trade-off? So, Brent, kicking off this topic here, how would you begin to, like, to frame up this discussion? Uh, I think... In the course of building something or like doing hard things, you're normally sitting in a room at some point and having a discussion and uh, a debate will arise about the idea that we could build something and do it right the first time and take a little bit longer. So something could take four weeks, six weeks, whatever. And then you might have like typically an executive or someone maybe a little bit further along in their career sitting there and saying, well, why can't we do it in one week? Or why can't we do it in two weeks? And then there becomes this discussion about like, well, we can move fast and, you know, have bugs or break things or, you know, however you want to frame it. Or we can kind of like take our time and slow is smooth and fast and whatever the phrase is. And that's more or less how go the conversation goes. Go slow to go fast, goes. Brent. Yeah. That's more or less how the, the conversation goes. I think where, what this like typically misses, this conversation, is that there are many examples throughout history and throughout like companies where these companies figure out how to, how to do both at the same time. So I think if you're like seasoned in your career, you you've probably been a part of some of those things. And I think both of us have, have had that experience. So when you have people sitting there telling you that you have to make a choice, it's sometimes hard to, hard to get behind. So let's give some examples of moving fast. Disneyland. Walt Disney brought the happiest place on earth basically from idea to launch in about a year. One year. The Empire State Building, construction was started and finished in 410 days, which is, that's kind of crazy. That's basically one year and two months, a little less than two months. And it was the tallest building at the time, if, I, if my memory is correct. Why does that feel completely impossible today? Because it is? It would never happen. Yeah. JavaScript, Brandon, is it Ike? Ike, yeah. Yeah. Implemented the first prototype for JavaScript in 10 days. Unix, Ken Thompson wrote the first version of Unix in three weeks. The iPod, Tony Fidel was hired to create the iPod in late January of 2001. Steve Jobs greenlit the project in March. They hired a contract manufacturer in April, announced the product in October, and shipped the first production iPod in November, 290 days after it started. That is very inspiring. How about some examples of moving slow? <laughs> Do you want to give the first one? Yeah, the, this this has been shared at least a lot in tech circles, but there is a bus path that has been proposed on a street in San Francisco called Van Ness, and it's like one of the uh, you know very prominent streets that runs north north and south through the whole city, and it was proposed in 2001, if my memory is yep. correct. It opened in 2022. And it kind of like, you know, poses a question of like, oh, is this like, you know, was there something fancy about this bus lane? Or is there some like, you know, did it power like an electric 
bus or something. I mean, literally, they, they had to, like, draw lines and widen the road a little bit, from my understanding. But for some reason, it took 21 years of uh, not, not even, like, stop and start attention. This was, like, constant pushing through red tape, more or less. There's actually, I think, a pretty good reason. Yeah. According to Paul Rose, San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency spokesperson, the project has been delayed due to an increase of wet weather since the project started. <laughs> a very wet 21 years in San Francisco. Yeah, that, that, that weren't there before. Okay, Duke Nukem. Yep. Give us the Duke Nukem story. So th this is like uh, a gaming example that is, this is very famous, but there was a video game called Duke Nukem that came out in the early 90s and it was quite popular, a uh, shooter type game. And they started kind of working on a sequel in the mid 90s to, to this game, Duke Nukem. And the game took 14 years to, to actually release. And this was once again, like, as far as I understand, 14 fairly consistent years of Effort. working on the thing. And I think. More or less, the the I don't know the the things that came up, up there were this pressure to deliver something even better than what they had already done because the first um, game that they released was was very popular and very successful and so there was kind of this internal debate of like how do we do something even to like one up ourselves um, but like stay true to the kind it's of it's like core. the the band the sophomore slump yeah. Same thing. Much harder to make Sequels second album on a first. movie. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so they dealt with that tension, but kind of got so twisted up into how to deliver on that that they like actually fully built a game or got like three fourths of the way through and then scrapped it and then did that like three or four times internally. And when they finally released the game, it was a massive flop. Um, nobody liked it and kind of. Uh, a very prominent example now of uh, one of the biggest flops in gaming history. Some good examples of speed versus slow. Slow almost is never great. But these are, these, speed versus slow, but a lot of these are posed as quality. Yes. They're, they're saying the reason it's taking so long mm -hmm. is you would not believe the yellow paint we are putting on this road. Yeah. <laughs> to build this bus lane. Well, or, or the, environmental aspects that were, you know, taken care of at the same time or not casting shadows on certain areas of the city, which sounds like a fake thing, but it's a constant debate inside San Francisco. There's kind of a, a guise of quality there around all these things. As it comes to like speed versus quality, I think a lot of times speed is basically saying not quality. That's essentially what if, if someone's making an argument for quality and they're saying, well, like, well, we could go fast, but we want to do it right. What they're saying is, if we go fast, we're going to do it poorly. Yeah. Like, it's not going to be a high quality product. And oftentimes, not oftentimes, every time, it really is more about trade-offs. It's about making distinct choices on where you're going to win and where you're going to, to not. And there's loads of examples of this in like our everyday life um, that businesses have had to decide, like we're, we're gonna invest here and not here for a reason. The easiest one to like draw a parallel to because we use it all the time is like take Walmart versus, versus Target. My wife loves shopping at Target. The experience is far better. It's, it, it feels way nicer. They do a much better job of uh, a guest selecting their produce, et cetera. Versus Walmart, they've made the decision, the trade-off was, we're gonna have lower prices than, than Target. And because of that, yeah, we got cheap fluorescent lights and the stands don't look good. And we probably don't do as good of a job of organizing our aisles. And um, these are like distinct trade-offs that don't necessarily tie directly into speed versus quality. But I think most of the time, you're getting not quality versus quality is the argument people are making here. So one of the things uh, to think about as that you talk about a lot at Remy is one of the ways that you can keep quality high 
and speed high is reduce the scope. Because this, this, this phone that we keep in our pocket now is 15 years in, people, I think, forget what the first version of the iPhone really was like. And I was well, as we were preparing and reading um, this, I was even thinking about a lot of our employees. Many of our employees were in third grade when the first iPhone came out. <laughs> That's true. They probably don't even know yeah. what the yeah. first iPhone was like. Yep. And so l let's, let's read a couple of this. Areas where Apple spent time and focused on details. User interface and touchscreen gestures. Multi-touch was like yeah. mind-blowing when no it came out. No keyboard was mind-blowing. Yeah, blowing. like not having a keyboard, yeah. like people just lost their minds. Um, I, I was a BlackBerry user at the time. Yep. And not having that tactile kind of keyboard was almost shocking. The hardware and the software integration, that didn't really, ex I mean, BlackBerry kind of had this, but all these companies like Nokia and Motorola, none of them were software companies. Even Palm, like the Palm Pilot, like the software was not like fused together with the hardware. Unlike the iPhone where you can't do multi-touch without the software that pairs alongside of it in a really elegant fashion. Obviously, of course, Apple is, is so well known for industrial design. And if you look at the iPhone 1 now, you're like, it's kind of a jank. But at the time, it was uh, the highest quality. Well, yeah, and if you compare it to BlackBerry, it's like not even in the same universe. Yep. Blackberries were, you go back and look at those and they feel very cheap. Yes, they do. Um, and then battery life. They knew they had to, th this thing, this bright screen, full screen, the, that was going to suck way more battery than your traditional phone, and they had to make sure that it could last for a normal day, which probably one of the reasons the iPhone, if you go back and look, is tiny. Yeah. The first iPhone. Yeah. And probably that has a lot to do with a lot of the things we're talking about here. Okay. Where they decided not to focus, what the trade-off was. 3G connectivity. The first iPhone only supported 2G, the edge network. Um, for those of you who are not around for the edge network, it was so painful. Yeah, it was like tap on a link and wait 20 plus seconds yep. every, every single time you navigated yep. anywhere. And the other thing that I totally forgot about until we were really you know, digging in on this, the websites back then. Yep. Nothing was built like it is today. Nope. Um, it's like a totally different universe. We kind of take it for granted. There wasn't mobile friendly anything. Not, not yeah. at all. Yeah. And I remember even like I would use that little scroll wheel on my BlackBerry to scroll sideways and vertically, like trying to navigate these web pages. And it's kind of uh, multi touch made it so much easier, but like they didn't even have 3G. And 3G was like well deployed at that point. Yeah. It was very controversial. Yeah. It's like this is going to flop. It doesn't even have 3G. It was for battery life. Yep. Yeah. Okay. The App Store. There was no third-party app store. It was introduced the following year yeah. with the iPhone 2, which happened to be called the iPhone 3G, and then the 3GS. And then the iPhone 4 came. Mm -hmm. The camera was a 2-megapixel, lacked features like video and autofocus. Not great compared to other phones of the day. Yeah, yeah multitasking. Like, you couldn't do anything. If someone called you, took over the whole screen. And if you wanted to, like go between apps, you had to close it, open the next app, you couldn't like swap and easily get between things. That seems like another universe now. Yep. And then of course, no MMS, we don't even call it MMS anymore, but basically sending photos in text message. And then no copy paste, which was, which was crazy. That was like a very infamous one. Yes, like it was. They got dragged for. And even when they launched copy paste, it was not a good experience. Very clear decisions on things that they didn't decide to do. I just listened to um, Linear interview Jeff Weinstein, who describes himself as a product manager at Stripe, but is kind of the head of product there. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about the way that they think about this at Stripe. And he basically just said very simply, we just get a small group of people in a room, and we break off little chunks, and we tackle it. It's very simple. Yep. And so one of the ways we have thought about at Remy, um, one of the principles that we have here is to make the cupcake first. So can you walk people through kind of how we think about this? Yeah, the analogy of the make the cupcake first is essentially that 
if you think about like cake making, you can kind of like choose to make, you know, a, a cupcake or you could make a wedding cake. And those represent, you know, something that's like a small focus feature versus maybe like a, a large product or a large feature or something like that. But at the end of the day, they both satisfy delighting a, a, a person that's gonna eat a piece of cake or eat a cupcake. But if you think about the work that it takes to make a cupcake versus a wedding cake, it's sort of night and day. I mean, a wedding cake is like a, a whole elaborate thing that takes a lot of time to do. Whereas a, a cupcake, you can kind of like get the batter put together, put it in a tin, put it in the oven, call it a day, put some frosting on top maybe. In the context of building product here and how we use this analogy, it's basically doing what we've been talking about. Like how do we go make the right trade-offs? And what's pretty common in trying to solve complicated problems is that you'll start with one like core problem that people all seem to agree that you know we need to solve. And we do a pretty good job of defining these up front I and mean, giving clarity to the team. Like here's the problems that we care about as the executive team, help us go solve them. What tends to happen though is it's almost like this like ball that starts rolling down a hill and all these other things tend to like start to Get aggregate to onto it. it and it's like a snowball that, you know, kind of spins out of control and grows larger as it goes down this hill. And we'll sit down like, you know, two weeks, three weeks after sort of giving this problem statement to a team and they're like, yeah, here's how we're gonna go solve it. And we're like, what's all this other stuff? I think it takes a lot of constant like prodding at this to help your team and our teams here realize like, hey, this stuff is all good, but like we've kind of gotten away from making the most succinct solution to this problem and doing that really well. Like back to the cupcake analogy, like you can make a very beautiful, highly crafted dough consistency, like uh, pay attention flavor. to flavor, flavor, like all the details and just nail the, the small execution. If it warrants it, like grow into the larger product over time, iterate on it, work towards some of the other things that, you know, you, you have the temptation to like glom onto the thing. That's like kind of how we use the analogy here. To take a, another kind of point from Jeff Weinstein at Stripe, I think one of the problems here is people begin to think about wedding cake versus cupcake is actually starting with the problem itself. Is the thing that you're solving for a massive problem for your users? And if it is, even if you solve 10% of that problem, they're gonna rip it out of your hands. And then what you can do is over time, you can go solve 100% of the problem, but they're gonna be patient because you're already beginning to help solve their problem. Whereas if you start with a problem that people are kinda like, eh, yeah, it's like, oh, it better be fully featured so that it even makes a difference for me. And so once again, like identifying the problem, what you said, like the problem statement itself, is so important of like finding a big, juicy, meaty problem to start with and then scoping it all the way down. I think one of the things that's helpful for me that we've gotten a lot of questions about from other people in this sphere is what are some practical ways that you can measure that you're scoping correctly? And you know, some of those ways that you've mentioned, I'm gonna let you kind of dig into this, is like how big should a pull request be? Like how much time should it take an engineer to do a PR? How much time should a set of PRs take as a project that a product manager is flowing down into an engineer? Can you walk, you know, kind of some of the, th the ways we think about this? The stuff you're poking at sort of represents the health of your engine overall and our signals around whether or not you might be making the cupcake or the, the wedding cake. So if we regularly see pull requests or like said another way, changes to the product in the form of code come through and they are 10 pages long, whatever. Lots of files change, thousands of lines of code. To us, this is a signal of not making the cupcake. So we actually measure it. We have a chart 
that just like average lines of code per pull request. And it trends over time. And we sort of have like our own internal feeling of what too high is. And, and the signal we're looking for is, are we making wedding cakes or cupcakes? I think another thing that's more like process related is a lot of times, this isn't even about like the size of product, but it can be actually be about number of steps in your process, which I think is more the reason that a, a place like San Francisco takes 21 years to make a bike path or a bus path. All these approval processes and all these sort of things to go check off to make sure that you don't offend anyone or make zero mistakes um, result in a very slow process. And the way that we kind of get at this in the, the code product sense is when a pull request is open on GitHub, we measure the amount of time that it takes from when the engineer says, hey, I'm ready to put this into the code base to the time that it actually lands in the code base. In a lot of companies, you'd think that that time period would be like same day as like, I don't know, like that makes sense. Most companies, it gets out to be like multiple days, sometimes weeks, where it's, it's literally done and it's just sitting there because it has to go through all of these sorts of checks and balances to like end up providing value to your users. So we measure this exact thing very, very carefully. For us, we want this to be under 10 minutes. And that represents that like a whole bunch of things are going right um, in, in terms of our balance here on like speed versus quality. These are not commandments, these are health checks. Yeah. Ways that we can proactively measure whether or not we are living up to the philosophy that we have, which is scope it down and release, and then make it better over time. So I just want to take a pause. Uh, separate from like the product and engineering side, there's a go-to-market side of this as well as it relates to cupcake versus wedding cake in that visually this is very easy to understand. How many people can a cupcake feed? One. Probably. Well, I mean, you probably. A wedding cake can feed a wedding, yeah. however big that wedding is, right? A lot of times that means one way to scope down the, prog the actual focus is who you're building for. So do you want to walk people through kind of how you think about this? Yeah, I think the concept of building towards a user persona is nothing new or revolutionary, but I think it does get overlooked, especially at early stage. Um, when you're trying to find your way, build something that people want. You know, you might build a product that has kind of like competing priorities that you maybe don't even fully appreciate. The most common one I think that people run into is, do I build for big businesses or small businesses? And the types of things that those people value are quite different. If you're building for a big company, you have to deal with all kinds of security requirements. You have to deal with different roles that they that like users have. You have to deal with, you know, more complexity in the configuration. It needs to work for maybe 200 people inside of one company. They have different needs and priorities. Whereas if you're building for like small businesses, they, you know, just have different concerns that they care about, and you can maybe take a more opinionated approach on building. So. I find that a lot of times, even if you're aware of this, people kind of get uh, crossed up here. Like we, we have this problem here all the time. We talk about the need to build things for our roofing partners. Like we want to make their job easier. And we'll come up with this uh, proposal around, you know, maybe something like scheduling, for example. In an ideal world, uh, a roofer can sort of not have to worry about scheduling a time with the homeowner and we somehow magically just make things show up on their calendar and then they go do the jobs. As we go to solve the problem though, I think you know, one person in the product group will come at it from the angle of solving this problem, like solving scheduling for a roofer with no front office staff. Like, no secretary, no person answered the phone. 
they're literally doing everything. Like if you call the roofing company number, you're talking to the guy on the roof. And then there's obviously like much larger companies that we work with who have 10, 20 people that work in an office and help administer all of this stuff for them. And let's just say we have a PM and a designer at Remy, like one will come with each point of view and they will try and marry those together into one product. And so it might be that in one case we're saying, how do we do scheduling for someone that doesn't even ever sit down in front of a computer and everything needs to go through text messaging and everything needs to go through the phone, mobile friendly, whatever, or we need a mobile app, like all that type of conversation versus if we build something for the other company, it needs to be on the desktop and they need to be able to coordinate across multiple crews and all these other things. And if we try and do both at once, we're not making the cupcake. And we're probably not delivering anything that anyone wants. Yeah, or we take way longer to do it and we do both of those things uh, less good than yeah. one at a time. I think people forget some of these details. When Facebook went public, they did not have a mobile app. Yeah. And the reason that their stock dove after was mobile computing was like doing this. And all of Facebook's advertising revenue was on desktop. And there was an unclear amount of understanding as to whether or not Facebook was going to be able to capture mobile advertising, which seems so stupid now. Mm -hmm. But that was a real thing. Yeah. Lots of companies have to decide, am I building an iPhone app or an Android app or both to start? Am I building for this size of company, this size of company, like what you described? There's a lot of ways to kind of scope down and really delight a very specific set of customers in a very specific set of use cases and still deliver a very high quality product. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit more about product for a second. So one of the ways that the team has helped me as a non-technical founder and the CEO of our company is I wanna see products in the scope of like engineering days. Just gives me some like relative metric that I can measure projects against themselves. Maybe a different way to size t-shirts. Yep. In, a, in, a, in a functional way. And if I see a, you know, this is like a real world example. There was a project where it's like, this project is like 80 engineering days, which is a lot. What we found was this wasn't just one product. It was five products that, that all come together to solve a big meaty problem. But in the same way that Jeff is talking about, like take a slice, solve 10%, but what that exercise does is it forces the product managers to come in and break apart the problem. And then they have to prioritize what is gonna make the biggest impact and really makes thinking deep. So I just want you to touch a little bit more on like how we think about on the product side, you've focused a little bit more on engineering, on the product side, how we're breaking products down into bite-sized chunks. It's the same thing, there's just this temptation to go you like when you're feeling pain to go look into your backlog and almost like pattern match, like in our case, to decrease the amount of time it takes us to put on a roof. Here are all the things that seem to match. So I'm gonna kind of melt all of those together and here's decrease the roof time project. I need 80 days to do, to do it. It's normally a kind of like a red flag for me when I see that type of thing because what it signals is like lack of conviction about what we should go do to really move the needle. And it's kind of like, here's seven things that, you know, one of them will probably work. And I think furthermore, the reason that I don't like this approach is that when you're trying to use like seven little mini solutions to solve one big problem, it just kind of leads to like, too narrow thinking, you don't take as big of a bet. It's not as focused of a bet. And you also like tend to do pretty poor jobs at seven different things at once. You don't think through you know, all the details. And probably the worst outcome of all of this is that a project like that always goes over and takes longer and turns in from two weeks into six months yep. real quick. So when I see that, I come in like a big wrecking ball and just 
smash that thing apart until it is like, you know, in small little chunks because we don't have six months to waste. And also, um, you say this all the time, the quality of decision making in engineering compounds, like maybe more than any other discipline. It's not a given that just because you've identified a problem that you've identified a great solution. And it requires deep thinking and it requires you to really explore the problem space. There are some of these things, if you're like, wait a minute, like if we can't come up with something that's gonna be meaningfully impactful in like a week or a few days, then we didn't explore it deep enough yet. Some of these things are, are easy enough for non-technical -pe non people to understand, like dummy like me, where I can begin to kind of get a little bit of intuition in an area I don't know much about. Would you say, to summarize, speed versus quality, you can build quality products very, very quickly if you scope them down and then make them better over time. Is that the way we think about this? Yeah, I think, um, you know, all this is company dependent and context dependent, whatever. You, like, this approach doesn't work if you are building a rocket yep. or something like that. Sometimes you have to kind of, you know, or, or like hardware for that matter is, is a little bit trickier. But I do think that the more you can get conviction on what really matters to your customers, the easier this is. So the companies that we all admire, Stripe, Linear, Apple, if you dig into their histories or you listen to their founders, product people talk, they all have these lists of very clear trade-offs that they're making. The discussions are not binary such that when they're sitting in the room saying, how can we do this in a year? The, they don't have this like tension that, you know, it's founder saying this needs to happen in four weeks versus the engineer saying, cool, if we do that, we're going to ship a ton of bugs. So which one do you want? It's how do we do less? How do we focus? How do we narrow the scope and have both? Frank Slootman. Yeah. Narrow the focus, increase the speed, and uh, usually results are very, very, very strong. This wraps up another episode of the Rise Over Run podcast. Grateful that you joined us. We'll see you guys on the flip.